Hello again, and welcome to more Photoshop tutorials. This is a popular one, and I want to show you a good way to go about it, and it has a really great end result. You can see that here in Photoshop I have two images open, and the idea here is I'm going to take something like a poster, graphic, logo, advertisement, whatever, and put it onto an actual photograph of a, uh, a wall or some uh, real uh, surface. Uh, we want to make it look photographic, look like it's actually there on the wall. So we'll start with this image right here. And I'm just going to make a real quick selection and come right here along the edges, pull that out about like that. And we can easily just uh, Command C to copy, Command V to paste, and there it is. So we can see that in Photoshop, don't need that anymore, so take it by and uh, let's save. All right, so in Photoshop we now have two layers, our background layer and our layer here. I'll just uh, double click on that and I'll call it um, poster. Great. Now a really great way of working in Photoshop is to work non-destructively. I stress this as much as I can all the time. And one of the best ways to work on destructively, especially with photographs, is to turn them into smart objects before you do anything else. So before I do anything else, I will right click on the background layer and I will convert to a smart object. I'll come to my poster layer, right click on that, and I will convert to a smart object as well. Okay, now we begin the work. Because this is a smart object, anything I do will be uh, non-destructive. So any transformations, filtering, uh, masking, anything is going to be non-destructive. So the first thing I want to do is when you're um, taking and putting an image onto some type of a photographic background, you want to have it match the perspective of the scene. If it doesn't match this perspective, then it's really going to look off. It's going to look wrong right away. So I'll do a Command T to transform, and I'll uh, right click on it. And here we'll do a uh, number of transformations. Probably one of the best ones for this is actually uh, skew, one of my favorites. Because we can actually take with a corner here and skew one corner into position. Now the most important thing, the very first thing, is you need to match the perspective of the scene. So in this case I want to match lines that are vertical and horizontal. So there would be, say, uh, horizontal line right along here. I'm trying to go along with those bricks and I'll take it to the edge. I'll take this here to the edge of this wall just like that and take this to the edge of that wall as close as I can. It's okay if it's not really perfect. And then I can see that it needs to go down a little bit to sort of match the angle of the bricks. So something like that is good. It's important to know that these um, lines are not perfectly vertical and so we need to match that. Now, of course, the image is, is all scaled out of proportion. It's 199% by 107. These are things we don't want. But I've matched the proportion, the angle of the scene. And once I've done that, I'm going to right-click and choose Scale and scale it into position. Once you've matched these uh, angles and these lines, you can't grab it and move it. Now it's going to be wrong. So I'll undo that. You have to do everything by scale, and then it will be correct. So if I grab this side and I scale it in, and I grab this side and I scale that in, that's going to match the perspective of the scene. And I want to put this back to where it's more or less around 100%, or at least the, the width and the height being about the same. So I'll take this uh, height, and if I've got the height here is about 89%, we're going to make the width about 89% uh, or so. Uh, because there's not a whole lot of perspective on the scene. The width and the height are really going to be about the same. So that's pretty close uh, right there. And um, I'll just leave it as, and I'll hit return or enter. Now the great thing about this is that because it's a smart object, if I were to do a Command-T once again, I can adjust that, and it keeps that, that angle. You have to adjust it, though, by scaling and dragging the sides, not by moving. Okay, but this looks good, so I'll hit Escape. So we've put in some um, some artwork here. This is uh, computer-generated artwork. 
So whether it's 2D stuff like logos in Illustrator or 3D renders or whatever, the thing to notice about CG artwork, if we zoom in really tight, is that compared to a digital photo, it's going to look really sharp. It's going to look too sharp and too uh, fine and perfect to match with a digital photo. Now I've zoomed in here to 200% and sometimes I'll even zoom in more. But the important thing to do is to, um, to make it match the look of your digital photo. So here we have the artwork right here. Here we have the, uh, the photo. And um, the two things that stand out. One is this is far too sharp as compared to the photo being a little blurry. Also, the photo has noise. And the noise is this sort of texture over here. And of course, um, CG artwork does not. So a very common thing when you're doing um, compositing like this or uh, for VFX or, or whatever, for just photos, you probably want to add some blur and some noise. So because this is a smart object, I can go to a filter and any filter will be a smart filter and applied non-destructively. Common blur to use is of course Gaussian blur. It's been in Photoshop for a long time. So again, we're gonna zoom in really tight, maybe two or 300%. And the whole point here is I want to blur this so that it matches the blur of the photo behind it. And you don't want to blur it just for the sake of, of having it be blurry. Your point is to match this. So the nice thing about Gaussian blur is you can blur in very small increments. And often you'd be blurring in increments that are less than one pixel. So I've got here with this one, I'm going to do 0.6 pixels. And I can see that softened up the edge there quite a bit. It's also gotten rid of some of the... Uh, JPEG compression artifacts, that's nice as well. So I think 0.6 pixels looks pretty good. And again, I can always change it if I, later if it doesn't work. So I'll say, okay, the wonder of smart filters. Now I need to add a little bit of noise to make it match. So a common filter for that is noise and add noise. You might wonder why this filter is here. Usually with photographs and stuff, you're trying to reduce or get rid of noise. It's for this actual purpose of compositing photos, especially with CG art together. So you can see I've added some noise here. Um, generally, I would speak, uh, I would keep something like Gaussian, so that there's no identifiable pattern. But your big, uh, your big decision is going to be monochromatic or not. See, so monochromatic noise is just black and white and gray. If you turn it off, it has some of these colors in here. But basically, you want to look at the noise in your photo. As I'm looking at this, I'm not seeing a whole lot of color noise. It looks to be mainly just value noise. So I'll turn on monochromatic. And we'll see that. Now it's probably too much, so I'll take that down a little bit. And we'll say uh, maybe even less. Um, Gaussian blur gives you some odd increments here. And I'll say OK. So that's a bit of noise. It might be all right, but the big problem here is that the noise is rather hard and crunchy and sharp and needs to be soft and blurry like the photo. Well, it all happens to, to depend on what the uh, order is of the filters here in your your uh, smart filter list. So Gaussian blur went on first and then the noise goes on. So the Gaussian blur is blurring the photo but not the noise. So if I were to grab this and drag this above the noise, now check that out, the noise is getting some Gaussian blur and the photo or, or the, um, the image here is. And that's kind of what you want usually to have that noise on underneath that. So as I look at this, I can turn off that noise I can say it's probably a bit too much. And uh, you really only know how much that noise is going to work once you have a blur on there. So I'll double click on that noise. And this is the wonder of smart filters. I'll take it down to a very, very small amount. And so that, you know, will probably be okay. And we'll zoom back out here. All right, so things are looking better. But uh, let's see some other things we need to fix. A big one here is going to be the colors. Now, when you work with uh, logos and, and uh, iconic art like this, especially in Illustrator, you'll have things like pure white and pure black. In your actual photos, you're really never going to have pure white and pure black, especially for something that's non-illuminated. So in something like this, the most luminous, the brightest thing should be the sky. Anything white here needs to be quite um, a darker value than the sky here. So the thing I'm seeing here, we want to make this fit in, is the values are far too extreme. The white is too white, the black is too dark, and the red is even way too um, bright and saturated. So we're going to take care of this with adjustment layers, another great way of working non-destructively. So first thing I'll do is I'll add a curves adjustment layer. 
I want to make sure this affects only this image on this layer, not the background layer. So I'll hit this little button here to clip it down to just this layer. Now the Curves Adjustment layer can be a little bit difficult to use if you're not really familiar with it, but there are some tricks to make it fairly easy. The first thing is to look at the histogram. So if I unclip this, you can see the histogram carries all the values here from that image. And if I clip it to the just this one layer, all that's gone. It's keeping a big spike of white and close to white, which is this. And there's a spike of right here and right here, which is kind of the black and the red. So in order to take care of that, I want to make sure this button here is clicked. And I'll click right here in this white. Actually, I don't need to even click here because that's already selected. That's already the, the, um, the topmost value of white. And then I'll use my down arrow, my keyboard, to move it down. So what's happening here is that anything that goes down below this 45 degree line is going to darken the original value. Anything that goes up is going to brighten it. So if I take this down a bit, you can see now that that white really is darkening down, which is what we want. And now if I come here and to click on the black, oh, I see that little spike right there. If I click right there, I'm going to take and move that up a little bit right there. And so now we're brightening that, that black a little bit. And so if I want to look and see, make it match the colors and in, in, values in my image, now here are some of the darkest values along in here, and they're just not really anywhere near this dark. So I'm, I'm brightening up this. I may even click here on this solid black right here and kind of take that up as well. So I'm effectively reducing the contrast from that to that. And that's working, looking a little bit better to fit into the image. Uh, another thing to do here would be this red looks really kind of too saturated to fit in here with this overcast kind of grayish uh, look of the photo. So I'll do another adjustment layer. And a good one to use here might be Vibrance. Again, I'll click this little button here, make sure I clip it down. So both these adjustment layers will affect only this one. All right, so looking good. So I can take down either Vibrance like that. And then there is also saturation, which is an easier thing to understand. In this case, they're kind of both about the same, but I'm taking it down just a little bit, negative number, so that the colors here are not that vibrant. It really needs to fit in with the look of this. And often you're really dumbing down or degrading your photo, your image, your, your logo, your CG artwork. You're dumbing it down by putting noise, blur, and then desaturating the colors and, and, and reducing the contrast to make it fit right here with your photo. Uh, and of course, the great thing with the adjustment layers is they are um, non-destructive. I can double click here and uh, even adjust this a little bit more to kind of lighten up some of those darks. So what you have here is the darks are getting lighter and the lights are getting darker. This is really the opposite of what you're often doing when you're adjusting photos, in which to improve the contrast, you're increasing the, the brights and you're darkening the darks just a little bit, which improves the contrast. Here we're actually going just the opposite, which is lowering the contrast. Generally not what you want for a photo, but what you want for uh, something like this. Okay, so we're done with that. Now we're gonna look and see the thing we really want to do is we want to make this match this texture and, and um, look good on this texture. So because it's a weathered old brick wall, we want it to look like it's weathered, like it's been there a long time and parts are flaking off and um, peeling off and kind of you know matching the texture of the wall a little bit. So we think, well, maybe it would come off on the higher parts where the brick is, but then where the mortar is, it would still remain if the whole thing is applied there. So the question is how we're going to do that. And of course, we can't erase it because it's a smart object. We'd have to mask it some way. There's a really nice way of masking something, which is in uh, some of the, uh, the layer effects right here, which we'll take a look at. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off this layer. And I want to look at this image right here. And I want to look and see how much contrast I can find between the brick and the... Um, the mortar in between them. And we're going to go to the channels. Of course, because this is an RGB image, we have red, green, and blue. And you should always really work in RGB in Photoshop. So I'll click on the red channel and look at the contrast. This is just grayscale contrast between the brick and the mortar. 
I'll click on the green channel. The green channel has much more contrast than the red channel. That's nice. I'll click on the blue. And the blue has maybe a bit less. So if I look at these channels, I'm going to see the green. And the green has a good bit of contrast. And the blue doesn't. Um, so, you know, I might, I might stick with that green. It's kind of a, of a, um, a choice between green or blue. But we'll see what happens there with that. Um, actually, I think I'm rethinking this. I might do the blue, even because there's less contrast here. But notice how the bricks kind of stick more together with their contrast. Where with the green, this lighter band really stands out. So, it's kind of personal choice here, but I think I'll stick with the blue. And I'll go to and click on RGB and go back to layers. And here's why I went to the channels. So I'll turn this on, I'll double click on the layer to bring up the layer style. Move this over here a little bit so we can see what's going on. There we go. So we're going to use an option here called Blend If. And this is a really kind of almost secret hidden feature within Photoshop. I don't see it documented much. But Blend If is really Adobe speak for Make Transparent If. And what we can do is use either this layer or underlying layer. We can make parts of this layer transparent based on its own colors here, or parts of the layer transparent based on the underlying colors right here. We want to move, remove some of this because of the brick texture, so we'll use underlying layer. Notice how you can choose blend if gray, red, green, and blue. Gray would mean the grayscale values of the, all the channels together. These would be blending or making transparent based on what the, is in each color channel, red, green, or blue. And that's why we went to the color channels to make this distinction. So since I find a side on blue, I'll click blue, and we're going to make this transparent or blend based on the values in the blue channel. So if I take this dark slider and I start moving it across, what you should see is that eventually the image starts to break away or become transparent, again, based on the values in the blue channel. Channels really are the key to, to effective and quick masking, and very powerful masking too. And so basically it's kind of uh, removing it or blending it based on the, the the bricks. So the darker color, which would be the brick, is it's blending based on that. If I were to do it with the white slider, the light slider, it would start to blend based on the uh, mortar color in between the bricks. So I want to, uh, since the bricks are higher than the mortar, I'll blend it based on the darker color here. Oh, that's too much. There we go. Something like that where it just starts to drop away into sort of wear away like it's been there a long time. Now I'll zoom in here and show you one problem with blend. And what you'll see here is the blending or the transparency masking is all or nothing. It's 100% here, it's 0% here with these harsh edges. And you can't have that. That just does not look good at all. So the thing to do here is we need to soften or have different levels of blending between 0 and 100%. Now the way to do that must be one of the uh, most um, hidden and undocumented features in Photoshop. But if you take this slider and you Option or Alt click it, you can split it apart. And notice that as you split it apart, those edges soften up. And now it looks good. Now we want soft edges that are anti-aliased and look, look like they really fit in. So basically what we're saying is over dark colors from here to here, it's completely 0% knocked out. Over lighter colors from here to here it's completely 100% visible and in between these sliders here is a variation between 0 and 100% of visibility. So the farther apart these sliders are the softer that edge becomes. So depending upon what you're looking for you might just want a little bit of distance but you have to option or alt click and split those two halves of that slider apart. So if I zoom back here like 100% I want something that looks good based on the texture uh, behind it and also the, um, the, uh, the softness of the photo, how much blurriness is there. So I'm thinking this is pretty good. I can go in there and that looks all right. Um, so I'll keep that for now. But again, because this is just a layer style, it is non-destructive. So looking pretty good and there's really not much there. Now that's just um, not much not much to do, but the end result is really good, but it's not quite there completely. 
I'd like to do a few more things to it to make it really look like it's on this brick wall. First of all, the brick wall isn't slick and smooth. It's bumpy with these brick textures and in and out and all that. So I want to try and um, suggest that here in my poster on the wall. And that's going to be done with a distort filter, which is called Displace. But Displace actually needs an image called a displacement map, first of all. And that's going to be a grayscale image. So what I'll need to do is I'll need to get, have a grayscale image of just this, um, this photo right here, just this background. And it's going to, uh, this place filter will displace or move pixels up and down based on the gray scale values of this. So what I can do is with this layer, I'm going to add a uh, black and white, there we go, uh, adjustment layer. And maybe try and bump up the contrast a little bit there with that. And uh, there we go. So this something like this would be a displacement map. And uh, we need to save this out as a separate file, and it has to be a PSD. So what I would do is I would do File, Save As. There we go. And I'm going to make a copy. I'll save it here and just call it Displace. So, save that. Now, the displacement map has to be a PSD file. It can't be a JPEG or TIFF or anything else. Don't know why, it's just how it is. So I'll turn off that uh, adjustment layer. I'll turn this back on. The thing we want to do now is we want to load that displacement map and displace this image. So again, filter, uh, distort, and displace. It's gonna say, how much do you want to displace it? And the default is 10 and 10, that's okay. These things here, stretch to fit or wrap, don't apply if your displacement filter is exact same, or your displacement map is exact same size as your image, which it is. So these don't even matter. So click OK. Then Displace wants to know, do you have a, an image to use? And yes, we do. It's Displace. And we'll click Open. Great. Let's take a look and see what happened there. You can see how it made the image kind of bumpy, kind of go up and down based on the texture or the image in that displacement map. So we'll turn that off. It's like that, we'll turn it back on, and it does that. Now that might be a hint too much for this, the scale of this image. And if that's the case, just double click, again, the wonders of smart filters, double click on displace. So instead of 10 and 10, let's do five and five, and pretty much you wanna have these values to be equal. Click okay, once again, it asks for the displacement map. We'll say open and see how that works. So that's just a little bit of displacement or kind of roughening up over the bricks. And that looks a little bit better than this smooth, perfect line. So displacement map, that's pretty good. Let's zoom out. Looks pretty nice right there. I'm liking that. But I think there's something else that this needs. We've displaced it over the brick, but I'm also thinking, see how kind of flat these, these uh, uh, colors here look where it's where the image is still over the uh, the photo if there were brick texture underneath you might expect a little bit of highlight and shadow a little bit of texture on this to make it really work so to do that we need a filter that's called emboss and we're going to take the uh, background image and we're going to emboss that but we need to emboss a copy of it so i'll do uh, command or control j make a copy of this I mean, because this is, these are both smart objects pointing to the same image, there, any change in one will change the other. And this actually will help you don't have really two separate images. You've got just one image, but smart objects of it on two layers. So let me take this and drop it and put it way up here on the top. And now it's, of course, covering everything. Great. Now, because it's against a smart object, the filter is non-destructive. And the filter you want here is filter and stylize and emboss. That's it right there. So what emboss does is, oddly enough, it turns it gray, it turns everything gray, and then tries to kind of make embossed 3D edges along where the image has um, changes in value. So you see those changes there, it's almost like this is a, uh, if this were a solid color and you, sh and you were to shine a light on it, you'd get these highlight and shadows. So you can adjust, you know, the, the height how much it is, and that's probably way too much. We'll go back to something like, you know, three or four. And then also the, the amount. And the amount 
is going to make it, you know, really dark, really um, like it's a harsh light there. For something like this, we really don't need a whole lot. In fact, the default values are probably fine. So I'll say OK. All right. Now, because we're using clipping masks, here's our image, and we're using as a clipping mask for this adjustment layer and this adjustment layer. We'll do it on the same thing for this emboss uh, filtered layer. So to make a clipping mask out of a normal layer here, you need to option or alt click right in between the layers. See that? I'll hold on my alt or option button and, it, and I'll click it. And now you can see what happens is the emboss filter is now just visible on this layer right here, this embossed image. Of course, there's a problem in that now we have that gray and we've lost the original image. So this, this comes to an importance with using blending and blending modes. Now there are colors that are very important in Photoshop. Full on black, full on white, and 50% gray. Those are very important colors for compositing and, and all sorts of good things. And we have blending modes here that work with that. So for example, right here in the darkening blend modes, any, any white color on, uh, the, with these blend modes is transparent. With the brightening blend modes, any black color is transparent. With the overlay blend modes, 50% gray is transparent. So we'll make this overlay Oh, that was the wrong layer. We can't do that. We'll make this overlay. There we go. Now if I zoom in here, what you can see is there's a little hint of brick texture even over the image right here. A little highlight and shadow. And of course you can double click on the emboss and you can uh, adjust that. Uh, I like to maybe take the opacity down just a little bit just to kind of soften that. So we're just giving a little hint of that, you know, maybe 70%. Right? And we can still see that brick texture. If we turn it off, there it is nice and flat. If I turn it on, now I see a little bit of that brick texture right over the image, as though it were painted or applied right to that brick, and some of that rough wall is showing through. And there's the final image, painted right on the wall, matching uh, all the look of the image. And the thing is, everything we've done is completely non-destructive. We could fine-tune the amount of blur, the amount of noise, fine-tune the amount of emboss, fine-tune how dark or light it is right here. But the whole goal here is that as you look at this, you would never guess that it was a Photoshop image uh, composited, but it looks like someone just took a, a photo of this, um, this image and it was just put there right on the wall. In fact, as I look at that, I think maybe it needs just a hint more Gaussian blur. So I can take my Gaussian blur, double click on it, and maybe we'll try something like 0 0.7, 0 0.8 pixels and do just a little bit like that. Maybe the Gaussian blur should go on top of the displays. There we go. So the end result is that. So now you know you can never trust your eyes um, when you look at a photograph again because you never know what is really there and what wasn't. I hope you liked this tutorial and find good ways of using it in the future.